Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today, we will study Titus chapter 3. If you missed any of our studies, you can go to our website is kuim.org or you can go to our YouTube or SoundCloud channel. It is um, Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Before we continue, let's have a word of prayer today. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we all agree as touching this thing. I am praying for your utterance to speak boldly to your people today as your own oracle. Praying for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, anointing that will teach us, guide us, show us the things that are yet to come. Lead us into all the truth. Bring the word of God to us. Give us revelation knowledge and understanding. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. I pray that you will open eyes, ears, hearts of everyone listening. That you will minister to them simultaneously. You will give to them whatever you think they need today. I ask you, the Spirit of God, to help us to be able to separate what is God and what is not God. Help us not to confine ourselves with uh, human doctrines. We always propose to be doers of the word of God, not just hearers. And we know that unless you empower us, we cannot do it. So we ask for your empowerment. Father God, I thank you because by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will put a guide. You will set a guide over our mouth. That corrupt communications will never proceed out of our mouth. But only those that are good to the use of edifying. Only those that will minister grace to the hearer. We always give you glory, honor, thanksgiving, and praise for everything you have done in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. I welcome you today, everyone, for another teaching. We, have, we are still in the book of Tyros, and uh, so far we have covered uh, chapters 1 and 2, and today... We will cover the last chapter, which is chapter 3. Uh, before we proceed, I want to give you a brief summary. Uh, the book of Tyrus was uh, written by, is a, an, is a, is a um, pastoral letter written by Paul to Tyrus. And uh, Tyrus was at the island of Crete uh, when Paul wrote him this letter. Paul himself was at that uh, at Crete with uh, Tyros, but he left him. And after he left him, after he made his observations, he wrote to Tyros, instructing him to appoint leaders in all the cities where they have churches. And these leaders, he gave Tyros the criteria to make the appointment. Not only that they have to know the word of God and understand the word of God, they have to be doers of the word of God. He also told Tyrus to be a good example so that he doesn't give an occasion for hidden or unbelievers to mock Christ or Christianity. He also instructed Tyrus to exhort the people, the church members, to live a godly life, to live lives that will reflect uh, sound doctrine. And you can see here that he's talking about doing, doing, doing. Yes, uh, uh, Paul is addressing, after you get born again, your, your spirit, your new nature, which is now in Christ Jesus, supposed to be a fruit. So he is telling them about this fruit that is expected of them. Remember, they are not saved by fruit. Salvation is only by faith in what Jesus Christ did. 
But after you are saved, saving faith is never alone. It has fruit. And that's what uh, Paul instructs Tyros here to exhort the people of God. That is a quick summary. But you have to listen to the teachings uh, to be able to get the whole thing. So we're going to proceed. And I'll read Tyros chapter 3 verse 1. Remember them to be subject to rulers and authorities. To obey. To be ready for every good works. So Tyros is talking about uh, Paul is talking to Tyros here to remind the people to obey governmental authorities. You know, we are dual citizens. We are citizens of heaven and we are exalted to keep the laws of heaven and we are also citizens of this earth. And we are here now being exalted to keep the governmental laws and decrees. And I'm going to give you um, uh, more references because this is not the only place that the Bible tells us that we have to obey uh, the authorities. So if we go to uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 1 all the way to 3, and I'll read that to you. Let every soul be subject to the government to, to government authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So it tells us here, these authorities, they are appointed by God. And we are supposed to obey the rules and the regulations of the place where we live. Let me give you the second reference that is found in First Peter chapter 2, verse 13, all the way to 15. And I'll read that again to you. It says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of men for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as those who are sent by him for the, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. So you see here that he's telling us here we are doing it for the sake of God. Because it's a commandment of God. We are going to do it. He's telling us not to criticize authorities, not to be disobedient to them, even when we think they are wrong. Are you hearing me? Rather, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible, if you read all the way to verse 4, the Bible says, I exhort, therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for those who are in authority, that we may be able to lead a good and quiet life. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, who will have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. He says here, pray for those who are in authority. That's what the Bible tells us to do. So, because they are in authority, there are some who are in authority who are not Christians. And we pray for these ones in a different way. How do we pray for them? First of all, we will acknowledge that once they become Christians, their policies and their decrees will change. will begin to align with the word of God. So we pray for them this way that God will grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth so that they will recover themselves from the snail of the devil who is holding them captive against their will. So we want to break the power of Satan over their lives. 
whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, will shine upon them. So we see where the problem lies. In the book of Daniel, we see how Satan will set up uh, kingdoms over nations and he will put uh, demonic uh, spirits over these uh, uh, rulers. And these demonic spirits will be the ones influencing them to take, uh, 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 to, to do what they're doing. So what we want to do is Break these powers, these authorities that are over them, that Satan have said over them. So we pray that they will see the light of the gospel and that uh, they will be convicted by the Spirit of God. And once they see it and believe and become born again, most of the problems will go away because now they will make rules and decrees and regulations that will not contradict the word of God because they are now Believers. So we don't criticize them. And you remember that the one you pray for, you don't criticize. So we pray for them, even though we don't agree with their policies. Even though we understand that they are not Christians, but our goal is to break the power of Satan over their administration so that they will see the light of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And once they come into the kingdom, now they can be an instrument of righteousness to the whole nation. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, these governmental laws, you see, there are some times when Paul, when Paul was writing this letter, that was when uh, uh, Caesar Nero was the emperor he was, he was the boss of a Roman emperor, empire. Caesar Nero, if you study about him, he was a very, very wicked man. A man that has a vehement repugnance about Christianity. The same man that cut off his head with an ass. But Paul is writing here, exhorting us to keep the laws of the nation. But he, he was put to death because he went contrary to the laws of the government of the Jews. That was the reason why he was killed. So we're going to ask here, is Paul contradicting himself? No. And the reason is this. Whenever these laws, whenever we begin to see the laws of the nation contradict the word of God, then we have to go with the higher law. What is the higher law? The higher law is the word of God, the law of God. Let me give you an example. In the Bible, Jesus Christ said, go into the whole nation and preach the gospel. And, and then Let's assume that in the place where you live and the government says you will not preach the gospel, who will you believe? Who will you obey? Even in the nature, we have a law of gravity. But there comes another law that supersedes the law of gravity, which is the law of lift and trust, which is the reason why you see airplanes fly in the air without coming down. So whenever there is a law, that uh, contradicts the word of God. We are no longer under obligation to obey that law. This is not called civil disobedience. Rather, it is called obedience to the word of God. And where, where, are we, where am I getting this from? You can see this in the Bible. If you go to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. And you can get, if you, if you want to read the whole chapter, you will get the whole picture of it. Acts of, the, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. But let me give you something of what happened there. The summary of what happened there is when Peter and John, when they were, when they, uh, uh, by the power of the Holy Ghost, healed the man who was born lame at the gate called Beautiful in Jerusalem. 
the elders, the, the, the people, the teachers, even, um, even, um, uh, Ananias and, uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, they laid hold of them and they put them in jail. And the next day, they brought them out and they charged them, they warned them never again to preach the gospel in the name of Jesus. Never again to teach the people anything again about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Peter and John responded. He says, you judge whether it be right for us to listen to you rather than listen to God. And they went ahead and they continued. As a matter of fact, they went to their own company and they prayed together, asking God to give them even more boldness so that they can preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what I'm saying here is, anytime the government puts a law that contradicts the word of God, even though we are exalted to obey governmental regulations and governmental authorities, the law of God supersedes the law of the government. So we must obey the law of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go to verse 2. To speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. He brings about something very, very important here. He says, to speak evil of no one. He's talking about the power of the tongue here. The power of what we say. He's talking about the damages that can come from our lips. James in his writing says the tongue is a small member of the body, but it boasts of great things. He says, how great a fire that the small tongue can kindle. He says the tongue can change the course of life to, 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 to fire. Which means the tongue is a very, very important element of our body that we have to control. There are so many scriptures in the Bible telling us about the importance of the tongue. The psalmist says, set a guard over my mouth. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 10, the Bible says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his mouth from evil and his lips from speaking guile or deceit. He says, for he that will love life, which means someone, if you want to live a long life and see good days, which means be prosperous in your life. He tells you where the secret lies. He says, it lies in your mouth. It lies in your tongue. It lies in the thing that you speak out. He says, once you get hold of this area of your life, prosperity will be yours. Longevity will be yours. The Bible tells us that um, he that keeps his mouth keeps his life. But he that opens wide his mouth will have destruction. So what are we saying? Are you using your mouth as a, a, a two-edged sword? A sharp object to tear people apart. The Bible says, let no co corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. <clears throat> but that which is, you, which is good to the use of edifying, that he may minister grace to the hearer. He says, 
let the only thing that you say about other people be things that will minister grace. Things that will edify, which is things that will build up. Not the things that will tear down. <clears throat> the power of tongue is very, very important in our lives. To be successful in life, you got to control your mouth in what you say. People have committed suicide. People have gone into depression, anxiety, because of what was said to them or because of what they said. And now they turn around and they regret. The word of God doesn't want us to go to that extent. Now, if you are using your mouth, I say two-edged sword to tear other people down. There are consequences. Remember, each time you, every time you counter people, every time you counter with your mouth, you are only encountering one person at a time. One person at a time. But time will come when all those that you have encountered will gang up against you. And that's when you will get that. You know what the Bible says? Good measure, praise down, shaking together, running over, shall men bring unto your bosom. That scripture is not only limited to material things. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spiritual law of telling you that whatever you sow, you're going to get abundance of it back. So now when these people gang up against you now, it's just you against this a lot of people. And they will make your life miserable. And they begin to avoid you like a plague. Because of your mouth. So it tells you, whenever you don't have anything good to say about somebody, it is better that you keep quiet. The Bible tells us that a fool is known by the multitude of his words. Then a fool seems to be intelligent when his mouth is short, when his mouth is closed. You can't tell if he's a fool or not until he opens his mouth. People may be doubting whether he is a fool or not. But as soon as he opens his mouth, he will take away all their doubts. <laughs> which means he will confirm to them that a fool has spoken. So we got to be conscious about the things that come out of our mouth. The things that proceed out of our mouth. Let it be for building up of people and not tearing them down. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now we are at verse 3. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, Serving various lusts and pleasures. Living in malice and envy. Hateful and hating one another. So he's talking about before we were born again. Before you met Christ. He's talking about the old you. And you can see this contrast in, um, in um, Ephesians chapter 2. We are the Bible tells us that um, by nature we were children of wrath and that we were all dead in trespasses and in sin. But he turned around and said, but God in his mercy and in his love, where is he loved us? He says, has lifted us up with Christ Jesus. It means he has raised us up together with Christ Jesus and has made us to sit in heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. So he gives up the contrast. Now he's about to do the same thing here now. He says, before you were born again, this was the old you. Your mannerism. This is how you behaved when your spirit was dead, alienated from Christ. This is how you communicated. This is how you lived your life. But now in verse 4, He's going to tell you something different now. He's going to tell you what changed. What changed. And how it's, how it changed. 
So in verse 4 he says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, to the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he tells us what happened. He says, when we were living that life, that sinful life, the life apart from God, he said something happened. He said Jesus Christ came and he died and he gave us his life. He became a vicarious atonement. He says he made us his own righteousness. He took his, our own sins and he gave us his own righteousness. And he's telling us here that it is not because of our good works. Not because of what we have done. And this is the reason why so many people are not yet Christians, are not born again. Because their religion, what they teach in their religion is, um, is men looking for a way to approach God. A man looking for a way to please God. A man doing something to please God. Rather than a man receiving what God has given to him free of charge. This is the reason why so many religions, they are not Christians. Because they try to do and do and do. Whereas the Bible is telling us right here, it's not because of what we have done that we got born again. Rather, it is us receiving what Jesus Christ done for us. So it tells us here, by grace you are saved through faith. And not of yourselves. He it says, it's the gift of God, not through works. It's not of works at all. You cannot get yourself saved. If the blood of goats and animals could give us salvation, Jesus Christ died in vain. So don't you cannot depend on yourself for salvation. It is a free gift of God. All you got to do is you receive it by faith. And you say, thank you, Lord, I am saved. Blessed be your holy name. Glory, hallelujah. And then you look up to him, Jesus now, who has given you salvation. And you continue that way. You don't get born again out of because of grace. And after you get born again, now you want to be saved through works. Or maintain your salvation through works. It doesn't work that way. You are saved by grace and you maintain your salvation by grace alone. So it, that's what he's telling us here. And now, remember the Bible says, let, let, let me go ahead and pick up um, uh, uh, verse 5. He says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And then it tells you how. It tells you now how. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who did the work. The Bible tells us that uh, by one spirit are we baptized into the body of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, I believe. So now, that day you said to Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. The Holy Spirit was the one that recreated your spirit. The Spirit of God is now the one. And that day, when he recreated your spirit, he moved in. Now he abides in you. Because the Bible says you're but is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. So now he dwells in you. For the Spirit of God bears witness with our own spirit. He can only bear witness with your own spirit if he lives in you. So now, your spirit and the Spirit of God becomes one. This is the work of the Spirit. 
Now, the washing is talking about here of regeneration got nothing to do with water baptism. Are you hearing me? Because so many people would misinterpret this verse and talk about that you are saved by water baptism. No! Now, water baptism is only but a symbol of what happened. That you died with Christ and you were raised up together with Christ. Like we said in Ephesians chapter 2. So now, the word of baptism is just a symbol of what happened inside you. You can go to heaven without being baptized. As long as you are born again. Word of baptism is not a criteria for you to go to heaven. But it's a symbol that you are now born again, that you are now a child of God. That's all what a baptism is. And now we get to one more step. Follow me in segments. We, 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 we're going to make good out of this teaching. Just follow me. Now we get to the next step here, which is verse 7. That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He talks about justification right here now. He says, after the Holy Spirit recreated your spirit because of what Jesus Christ did at the cross. The Holy Spirit recreated your spirit when you said yes. And then he says, at that moment, you are now justified. The word justified can be literally translated as just as you never sinned. That is the way God sees you. Just like you never sin. So now, in the sight of God, when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that would be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So the Father God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. And you become blameless. And then the word the Bible says is fulfilled. Therefore, there is no condemnation to anyone who is in Christ Jesus. God does not condemn you. He sees you as one who is perfect. Your, your spirit is recreated in holiness. And in righteousness. But, what is going on? The thing that is going on now is that we have Satan condemning us. We have other people condemning us. We have ourselves condemning ourselves. But the Bible is telling us it's not supposed to be so. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. No one can condemn you. Do not let Satan condemn you. Remember what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. The accuser of the brethren, he says, Now the accuser of the brethren is cast down. He accused the brethren day and night in the presence of God. The one that accused the brethren day and night in the presence of God is Satan. He's accusing you. Bringing up points against you. He will speak to your mind. And he will say, you say you are a Christian. Look at what you just done right now. Christians don't live that way. And he will begin to question you. Begin to accuse you through his thoughts that he will plant in your, in your mind. So don't let Satan accuse you. When he brings those accusations, you just tell him, you only got a picture. The blood of Jesus has cleansed me from all unrighteousness. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will step far away from you. Do not let other people accuse you. Because there are people who will always point fingers at you. Fellow Christians. Judging you every minute, every second. Talking about your salvation, if you are too saved or not. But the Bible says, do not let them accuse you. For who are you to judge another man's servant? The Bible tells us. To his own master, he stands or he fails. Indeed, 
He will be made to stand. For God is able to make him stand. The Bible tells us. Who is he that condemns? The Bible says. It is Jesus Christ who died. And the Bible says. Yes he is the one sitting at the right hand of God. And the Bible did not stop that. He did not stop. The Bible did not stop there. He tells us what he's doing at the right hand of God. He says, making intercessions for us. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of Jesus Christ condemning you. Because he is the one, he is the only one who is qualified to condemn you. He was, he was the one that, that justified you and took your uh, uh, iniquities and your sins. So, if that should be anyone judging you, it should be Jesus Christ. But the Bible is telling you here, he says he is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty and he is interceding for us. When Satan brings his accusation against us, Jesus stands and says, Father God, I died for them. I gave them salvation. My precious blood washed away all their sins. They are justified on my account. There is nothing against them anymore. He is there making intercession for you even as we speak right now. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let no one condemn you. That's what he's telling you here. Who shall lay anything at the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Don't let anyone condemn you, my brothers and sisters. You are born again. You are the righteousness of God. Jesus washed away all your sins. Now, we should not condemn ourselves either. The Bible says, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. He understands all things. And he says, but if our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. First John chapter uh, 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 3 verse 20, I believe. So we have confidence to God, towards God. So whenever you begin to entertain that condemnation coming in, most of the time it will come through Satan condemning you. You do not join hands together with him. Don't give him fuel for his fires. Stand bold and reject that condemnation and say, I am saved by grace, not by works. Jesus Christ saved me by his precious blood. Not because of what I have done, but because of his love and kindness. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we'll proceed to verse 8. We're back in progress today. We are. And I am very optimistic we will cover this chapter today because it's not a lot of them. In verse 8, he says, This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly. That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and uh, profitable to men. So now Paul is writing to Timothy here now. He begins to talk about uh, good works. In other words, holiness. In other words, godliness. And uh, right here, he's not talking about the root of salvation. Like I said many times, the root of salvation does not require works. We are saved by grace through faith. You don't need works. You only depend on what Jesus Christ did. But after you are born again, James says, faith without works is dead. That new nature of you, if it's really a new nature, bears fruit. And the fruit that it bears is in the place of works, good works. So if you are born again, and the Spirit of God is in you, you were expected to have good works. 
If you remain in Christ Jesus, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that remains in me will bear much fruit. You will bear fruit. The Spirit of God is going to empower you to bear fruit. But so many Christians, this is the thing that trouble us. Whenever we hear these expectations of good works, of bearing fruit, it troubles us. It gives us concerns. It becomes a challenge to us. In the sense that we know that we don't measure up. And because we don't measure up, we begin to feel condemned. And we think that God is saying right here, you've missed it. You are condemned and you are judged. No, that's not what God is saying, my friends. He is not condemning you. Even though you are expected to bear fruit. The Bible tells us about bearing fruit. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That we should do those things which God beforehand has ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. So God created us unto good works. He expects us to bear fruit. He wants us to bear fruit as a matter of fact. Let me tell you, let me read this to you so that you will see that as a child of God who is born again, you were expected to bear fruit. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, all the way to verse 6, and I read, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness. So he gives you here, he says, to your faith, after you are born again, he expects you to grow, not to become baby Christian all the days of your life. He expects you to bear fruit by adding virtues, adding perseverance, adding self-control, adding knowledge. So it's an expectation for a Christian, a child of God to bear fruit. But this is a, this is not a condemnation from God. For we all, we know that every now and then we miss it. God himself understands that you are in your physical ability only but a dust. In your own physical ability, natural ability, you are only but a dust. Paul says, for I know that in me, and he says, that is in my flesh, the world's no good thing. He understand that. But let me tell you what God is saying instead. Instead of you or we thinking that God is condemning us and judging us and pronouncing condemnation over us because of the way we live and the way we've missed it? This is what God is saying. He says, my son, my daughter, I understand. But I want to tell you where you are missing it. And he says, in my words, through Peter, I said to you, all things that pertains to life and godliness, has been given unto you through the knowledge of him who has called you to glory and virtue. He says, all things that pertain to life and godliness I have given to you through my Holy Spirit. Pay attention so you don't miss this point, please. This is what God is saying. He says, all things that pertain to life and godliness. He says, I have given it to you through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And he says, but we, the place where we are missing it is because we are depending on our own self, on our own ability 
to be able to live a godly life. And whereby neglecting the leading, the power, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. He says, this is why we're missing it. And because of this, every day we live in condemnation. Because every now and then we miss it. Even after we stand bold and we say, I am not going to do it again. Even when we stand bold and we say, I, we promise God and we say, I will never do it again. Only to find ourselves going back again, doing the same thing over and over again. Why is this so among Christians? And God is telling us why. Because we are yielding to the impulses of the flesh. And we are neglecting the power of the Holy Ghost. Who now dwells in us? We are now depending on our own self-ability. And now we are neglecting the one that is in, in us now. It tells you now what the Spirit of God is. I'm going to talk about how the Holy Spirit does this. So that if you understand this, you will know that the power is within you to live a godly life. It will not be something that will trouble you anymore because you're not going to be doing it on your own strength, but you're going to be doing it on the strength, depending on the strength of the Spirit of God who lives in you. The Bible says, if we, by the Spirit, modify the deeds of the flesh, we will live. He says, if we, by the Spirit, are you hearing that? It's by the Spirit, not by your own self. You're going to fail over and over again. But if by the Spirit, which means if you begin to depend on the power of the Holy Ghost, you can now modify the deeds of the flesh. And as a result of that modification, you will live this life of godliness which God expects you to live. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Which means, if we depend on your own physical ability, you will fail all the time. It is death. But when we have that spiritual consciousness about the Spirit of God, His power that abides in us, when we depend on the power of the Holy Ghost, He says it's going to be life. And that life of godliness and peace will abound. That's what he's saying us here. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, him that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. The spirit of God has the ability to quicken your mortal bodies. Not only that he works in you in the spiritual things, but in the physical things as well. He can quicken you, quicken your mannerisms, the way you behave, the things that have held you in bondage for years, those addictions, those conflicts. He says the Spirit of God can quicken them by His own power that dwells in you. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, God is not the one who is condemning you. Are you hearing me, friends? So do not panic and put yourself in regret that you are not measuring up. He tells you where the problem lies. He says because you are depending on yourself. Jesus Christ, before he ascended, he told his disciples, he was going to send them another comforter. He says when he comes, he tells us what the Holy Spirit will do. He says he will lead you into all the truths. He will teach you all things. He will show you things yet to come. He will bring to your memory things spoken to you in the word of God. The Greek word Jesus Christ used is allos parakletos. 
The word parakletos is so rich, a Greek word, that we don't have one English word to express that word. We have so many words to express it. Words like comforter, intercessor, advocate, helper, strengthener, stand by. This is what the Spirit of God does. He is there to help you live the Christian life. He is there to strengthen you in the time of weakness. He stands by with you, laying hold together with you against the forces of darkness. The things that come against you in life. He is your good friend. Jesus says he's come to abide and he will abide with you forever. He doesn't visit and go. He is always in you. But the problem is that we have failed to recognize the spirit of God is in us. And once we fail to recognize the Spirit of God, then we begin to depend on our own natural ability. And this is why we fail woefully. And then when we hear about the way we should live, it troubles us. It bothers us. Why? Because we are depending on ourselves to be able to live this kind of life. And God says no. When you depend on the Holy Spirit, on the last day, that great feast, the last day of that great feast, Jesus standing on the temple mount, he shouts, he says, He that is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. For as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow the waters of living water. When you depend on the Holy Spirit, not only that he will help you now, but you become a channel, an oasis to the troubled world. The world that have covered themselves from the light of the glorious gospel, you become an oasis to this world through the power of the Holy Ghost. There is nothing that is impossible when you depend on the power of the Holy Ghost. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, Bible tells us they are the sons of God. You ought to be led all the time, even in the little details in your life. Depend on Him. So that's what God is saying. I am not condemning you. I know in your physical ability, you are only but a dust. In you dwells no good thing. But I don't want you to depend on your ability. I want you to depend on the spirit that dwells in you. And you're going to be able to live that godly life that I am writing to you through my apostle Paul to live. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, like I said earlier, it is Satan who will always condemn you. And other people will condemn you. It will get to a point if you begin to listen to the condemnation of Satan in your life, you will get to the point that you will begin to question your salvation. Yes, if you open that door, it's just a matter of time that you will begin to Question if you were really born again. You begin to ask yourself question if you are born again or not. So do not let any condemnation come. If you miss it, if you miss it, right there, the moment you notice that you missed it, that you missed the mark, raise up your hand and say, Father God, I missed it. I am sorry. I should not have done this. But thank you because the blood of Jesus washed away all my sins. Father, now I confess my sin because you are faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. By faith, I receive my cleansing right now and forgiveness in the name of Jesus. It's gone. Remember the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I separated, have I removed your sins from you. He will never remember them no more. He will not. It will all be gone. In our lives, in our Christian work, it is a journey. It is a journey whereby we look up to Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. We keep going. Remember what Paul says. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do. 
forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth on those things which are before. I press forth to the mark of the high price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. When you miss it, let go. Keep on going. Keep on going. For we all with an open face, beholding like in a glass, the glory of God, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of God. It tells you here, it says, by the Spirit of God. So, you look in the Word of God and you read. He said, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be. And the Bible tells you, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you become. And again you look and you read. You say, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be. And the Bible says, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you become. And it continues. It continues. It is a journey. You are not going to get to perfection in your flesh until you see Jesus, either by death or by rapture. So brethren, depend on the Holy Ghost. Depend on the Spirit of God. He is your helper. There is no other one. He is your own helper. Your own advocate. The one that God sent, Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit here. Just like he is. Just like he is. To be that one here that will help you live a Christian life. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are making progress. We are going to go to verse 9. But avoid foolish. Excuse me. But avoid foolish disputes. Genealogies. Contentions. And strivings about the law. For they are unprofitable and useless. So what is he saying here? You know there are people. Maybe. Those who are not Christians. Or maybe. Those who are from other denominations. They will come to you. And they will bring up scriptures. Just for argument. Just to challenge you. You know when I. In my early years of Christianity. I will argue anyone. I will bring out scriptures. You dare not come to me for argument. Because I will argue you to the, to the extent that you will live. And then I will. Ask you to fix another date. For that argument to continue. Yes, I, I did. <laughs> I did. In my early years. But you know what? It's a waste of time. The Bible tells us it's a waste of time. If they come to you because they want to know, and you know that they don't know, but they want to know, yes, sit down and teach them. Enlighten them. Give them the word of God. But if they are here to argue, to prove to you that you are wrong, then it is an unprofitable argument. And it's telling us, walk away from it. Don't waste your time in those things. <laughs> I did. I don't know about you. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 10, reject a, div a divisive man after the first and second admonition. Knowing that such a person is wrapped and sinning, is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. So he's telling us here, when a heretic, when someone is causing division in the church, could be a church member, remember, people who already start to be church members, being a church member doesn't make you a Christian. 
when they are there to cause dissension and division to the church, maybe through their teachings, through their heresies. The Bible tells us the modus operandi here, how to go about that one. If you are the minister or the one who is in charge, call to them, call them in love. Admonish them carefully. Tell them where they err, where they are wrong. Advise them to disease from such activities. But they, if they insist, if they insist and they're still doing what they're doing, Trying to divide the church of God. Trying to cause confusion in the congregation. Jesus tells us, if we read um, Matthew chapter 18, if you want to read Matthew chapter 18, it will be in verse 15 all the way to verse 17. But I'm going to paraphrase it for you. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go to him one on one. 101. Tell him about his sin. If he says, I'm sorry, forgive me, you've won a brother. But if he insists and will not accept his guilt, he says, Step with you one or two more people. Speak to him again. So that in the mouth of two or three, Witnesses, every word will be established. If he, if he does not listen, take him to the church. If he does not listen, he says, now you have to treat him as a hidden, as a tax collector. So what is he saying here? That one that is devising, that the one that is dividing the church. Remember the Bible says, there are six things the Lord hates. The seven is an abomination. And one of the things listed is that one that sows discord among brethren. The one that sows division among brethren is an abomination unto the Lord. So what are you going to do? After you've made an attempt to correct them and they're not listening, you disengage them from fellowship. Cut them off. They're no longer to fellowship with you. That's what he's saying here. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in final messages, we are in final messages now. Almost done. Verse 12, he says, And I send Atomos to you. When I send Atmos to you, or Titicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. So he's, he's, here he's talking about a, a Titus a replacement. So he's sending these guys here, Atmos and Titicus. He says, when they come to replace you, I want you to come and meet me at Nicopolis. And that uh, Nicopolis is, um, is, a, is um, a city of the coast of Greece. In verse 13, it says, Send Zenas, the lawyer, and Apollos to their journey with Hesh. On their journey with Hesh. That they may lack nothing. So it looks like this, um, uh, uh, it looks like uh, Zenas, the lawyer, and Apollos, they're going to be passing through Crete. And uh, uh, Paul is telling Tyrus here to equip them with abundance provision so that their journey will be easier for them. And in farewell, he says in verse 14, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. He talks about works again here, but at this time he's talking about works in terms of giving, providing for the needy. He says you are very fruitful when you engage in this type of uh, good works. 
Remember, the emphasis on this is good works. The fruit of salvation. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, I've come to the end of today's teaching. If you are listening to this message and you are not yet a Christian or you are not born again, remember that you can be a member of a church but you are not a Christian. To be a Christian means that um, you depend 100% on what Jesus Christ did. That he is a son of God. He died for your sin. God raised him up from the dead on the third day. And then you ask him to come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior. And you, be, you begin a, a good relationship with him. Personal relationship. That you put aside your own self-righteousness. Because the Bible tells us that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the presence of God. It tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It tells us that no one is righteous, not even one. So you lay aside those things and you come to Jesus Christ. Empty of yourself. And you depend on what he did for you. That's what it is to be born again. The only way you can be born again is through Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14 verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no one comes to the Father but by me. If you want to come to the Father, you must come through me. There is no other way. In Acts of the Apostles, Peter says, There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But the name of Jesus Christ. Except the man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you belong to other religions, and you think that you're going to go to heaven, because all roads lead to heaven, it's a big mistake because Jesus Christ is telling you here that he is the only way. And the Bible tells us that you cannot have the Father without Jesus. It's only when you have Jesus now that you can have the Father. This decision is what you have to make for yourself. No one is going to make it for you. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I will eat with him and he will eat with me. Jesus Christ says that, said that. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Don't delay it any longer. Don't say, let me go get my acts together or you keep procrastinating. The time is very short. What you want to do, you got to do it very fast. Jesus is coming back very soon. You don't want to be left. You don't want to go to hell because hell is a real place. We are those who reject Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior will spend eternity in Gehenna. A place of utmost darkness where there is no presence of God. Jesus says people will be, they will be gnashing their teeth there for eternity. So what are you waiting for? You cannot save yourself. If you could, Jesus would not have come. Just today, about 155,000 people died in the world. Where did they go? Some went to heaven, some went to hell. Depends on the choice they made while they're still alive. It becomes too late when your spirit leaves your body. You cannot change your destination at that point. It becomes too late. To make heaven, you must receive Jesus while you are still alive. If you don't do it, destination will be hell. Jesus says, if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. 
And people are condemned already because they don't believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's why they are condemned. But it's not too late, oh, bread. It's not too late, my brethren. You can change that today. You can miss hell today and make heaven your final destination by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And I'm, I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. If you pray this prayer, you mean it with your heart, you will now be born again. And you will become a child of God. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe he is your son. He died for my sins. You raised him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, I come, I ask you this day to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that I'm now born again and now I'm a child of God. My sins are washed away. Father, I give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Congratulations if you pray that prayer. I welcome you to the kingdom of God. Now, there is a subsequent experience after salvation. We call it the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It is evident by speaking with other tongues. If you want to know more about this, go to my YouTube channel, Simple Truth Gospel with Kyrian. There is a teaching there titled, Speaking in Tongues is for Every Believer. He will walk you through, teach you, enlighten you, so that you know more about this experience. Remember that you are now a baby Christian. It is very, very important that you find a very good church where they teach the word of God. Become a member of this church so that you can grow in your faith because faith will come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Buy a Bible and study the word of God so you don't remain baby Christian. Peter says, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. I want to use this opportunity to thank all our partners all over the world. Those helping us through their prayers, through their financial assistance to spread the word of God. Thank you so much. If you want to be a partner to this ministry, you can go to our website. It is kuim.org. And you will see a donation button. How you can securely give your gifts to help us even reach more people. I pray for you this day. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you prosperity and give you divine health. Remember, it's only those who hear the word of God and do it. They are the ones who get the benefits of the word of God. Surely there is an end. And your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Mangolom boros tokiya ara parungoro to si egelet etema ongorondom. Jendi buskubi.